Caitlin Phillips, and this is The Side Comment. In this episode of The Side Comment, Patricia Farah uncovers five lesser-known facts about the life of Isaac Newton, one of history's most revered figures. Hello, and welcome to this podcast about Isaac Newton. My name is Patricia Farah, and I'd like to tell you about my latest book, which is called Life After Gravity, Isaac Newton's London Career. Newton's usually associated with two places, his cottage at Woolsthorpe, where he supposedly watched an apple fall from a tree, and Cambridge University, where he gained his reputation as a reclusive genius who wrote a world-famous book on gravity, Principia Mathematica. But the place where Newton lived longest was neither of those. It was London, where he stayed for over 30 years and played two major public roles. He was president of the Royal Society and so a leading figure in European science. And he ran the Royal Mint, which manufactured all the country's coins. This position involved making economic decisions, rather like being governor of the Bank of England today. Unlike other books about Newton, Life After Gravity is not a straightforward biography. It's divided into three major sections based on a picture, a conversation piece by William Hogarth that illustrates the circles Newton moved in and the people he knew. They were rich and powerful, and they included women as well as men. Hogarth's painting shows four children acting on a stage in front of their aristocratic parents, as well as Prince William with his two little sisters. The canvas is packed with Newtonian references. For example, Newton's bust is on the mantelpiece, while in the audience, the royal governess is telling her daughter to pick up the fan that has fallen through the power of Newtonian gravity. The young actors are performing a restoration play by John Dryden, which describes how Spanish conquerors plundered Mexico for gold. Its themes were still relevant for Enlightenment politics and Britain's search for gold in Africa, the gold that Newton needed to make coins at the Mint. Newton moved in fashionable London society, which operated through patronage relationships and sexual intrigues. He entertained international visitors, mingled with royalty in the aristocracy, and was a close ally of the influential Earl of Halifax, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Both men were keen supporters of the Whig Party, and Newton's political loyalty played a big part in his metropolitan success, included being knighted by Queen Anne. Newton grew extremely rich and was clearly a big entertainer. When he died, his possessions included countless plates, glasses and cooking implements, to say nothing of that ultimate in Georgian luxury, two silver chamber pots. Although he could afford to live in style, economic times were tough, but his policies meant keeping prices high by restricting imports, especially from India and China. There were two main sources of Newton's wealth, his salary at the Mint, and his investments in the stock market. He lost a fortune in the financial crash of the South Sea bubble when he made the beginner's mistake of buying in at a high price and then watching the value collapse. He had more success with the East India Company, the global trading organization that was heavily involved in the triangular slave trade between Britain, West Africa, and the Americas. The Enlightenment is celebrated as the age of reason, but the exploitation and disparity it fostered lie at the heart of modern democracy. Newton was not himself directly involved in slavery, but like many of his contemporaries, he benefited enormously from the global capitalism that underpinned the British economy. As a stock market investor, Newton profited from the revenue generated by selling African captives to wealthy plantation owners. As master of the mint, he was responsible for making sure that African merchants received low prices for their gold. And he was also paid a fee for every coin that was minted, one reason why he became so rich. As a further advantage, Newton also benefited scientifically from imperial trade. When he was revising the Principia for its second edition, he needed observations of tides, and the best people to ask about that 
were employees of the East India Company and other officials based in foreign ports. Newton collected information from about 30 locations scattered around the globe, including La Gorée, an island just off the coast of Senegal that housed Africa's most notorious holding station for enslaved peoples. Their one-way route to the Americas lay through the door of no return. What is now revered as the world's greatest book on physics incorporates information gleaned from British colonialists who were both exploring and exploiting the globe. William Wordsworth imagined Newton as an abstract mind voyaging in strange seas of thought alone. My book paints a far more realistic version of Newton as a metropolitan manipulator ruthlessly climbing to the top. <laughs>